<clears throat> Hello and welcome to lecture 7 for the course ECE 252B spring 2020. Uh, this lecture is the first of four lectures that we will have on the topic of multiplication which after addition is the most important and frequently used uh, arithmetic operation. So we start with basic multiplication schemes today and we'll see some more advanced uh, topics, uh, different ways of designing multipliers in the subsequent three chapters. Okay, so let's begin by looking at the dot notation for uh, binary multiplication. Uh, here I've shown a 4 by 4 multiplication and dot notation. Uh, the terminology used is that one of the operands is called multiplicand, the other one is called the multiplier. Usually multiplier is written second. Although multiplication is completely symmetric, you know, it doesn't matter which one you call multiplicand, which one you call multiplier. But the way we execute the algorithm, the multiplier is treated differently from the multiplicand. And then the product P is what we obtain at the bottom. Now, uh, a and X, the multiplicand and multiplier, are k-bit numbers. And the product is double the width, 2 k-bit uh, in width. So 4-bit number multiplied by 4-bit number gives you an 8-bit number. And the same relationship holds in other bases. For example, two four-digit decimal numbers when multiplied produce an eight-digit decimal number as the product. So the product is always double the width, whether we do in binary or other radices. Now in this dot notation, you see some other stuff written. So let me explain that. So the way we multiply a binary number by another one, we take the first bit, the least significant bit of x, multiply it by a. Now in the case of binary, this bit is either 0 or 1, so the product of 0 or 1 by that number is either 0 for that number itself. So what you see here in binary is either 0, four zeros, or a copy of A. So that's why you see here that it is x0 times A times to the zero, that's because it's not shifted. The next row, you see x1 times a times to the one. The reason is that this x1 is in the second position, so it's worth two units. So if there's a one here, it's really two. That's why it's multiplied by to the one. Then x2 times a times to the two x3 times a times to the 3, and then these values will be added to give you p. All the blank spaces that you see here are zeros, and these are also zeros. This is, I'm, I'm considering an unsigned multiplication. So two unsigned 4-bit numbers give you, when multiplied, give you an 8-bit unsigned uh, product. Now, if I want to implement this in hardware, direct implementation is not very efficient because what I end up doing is that I have to form these partial products and then shift them by varying amounts. This one is not shifted. This one is shifted by one bit. This one shifted by two bits and so on. So that the ability to do the arbitrary shift requires a shifting hardware, uh, which adds to complexity. 
So the, the way this is implemented is through the multiplication recurrence. So basically, a partial product is initialized to 0 at the outset. And then we add to each partial product the product of the next digit of x times a times 2 to the k. Now, this pre-multiplication of a by 2 to the k is required because we do right shift. So instead of doing a left shift for the second number compared to the first one, we shift the first one to the right by one bit before adding this number. We shift the result of the first two up two steps to the right by one bit before adding this and shift the result of the first three values before adding this. So by the time I'm done, four right shifts have taken place. So basically, these values go to the right of this boundary. And therefore, pre-multiplying a by 2 to the k uh, sort of cancels the effect of those shifts. <clears throat> so in each step, I take the partial product up to this point add this value to it, and then right shift by one bit before adding the next, next one. So the shifts are always by one bit to the right, so that that's pretty easy to implement. It's not variable shift as in the original. And these partial products are accumulated from top to bottom. First the top one, then the second row, then the third row, and so on. So this red arrow shows the direction in which the partial products are formed and accumulated. And this is known as multiplication with right shifts. So basically, multiplication is done by a sequence of additions, each followed by a right shift. OK? Actually, if I don't initialize P0 to 0, but initialize it to some arbitrary value, then the process will give me, so if p0 is 0, the process gives me a times x. Otherwise, it gives me a times x plus p0 times 2 to the minus k. So this is sort of multiply add operation in general. If I don't initialize it to 0, but to some arbitrary value, OK, so this will be the additive term that will be added to the product at the end. I can also form and accumulate the partial product from bottom to top. So when I went from top to bottom, the previous result had to be shifted to the right before the next one is added. When I start here, the previous result should be shifted to the left before the next one is added. So the recurrence is shown here. In each step, you double the partial product, shift it to the left, and add the product of this digit of x and a. And this digit starts with xk minus 1. So for j equal to 0, this will be xk minus 1. So I start from here. Multiply this digit, this bit, by a to form this partial product. Multiply the second one by a to form this. So partial products are formed from bottom to top. And we have left shift for alignment. OK, multiplication with right shifts is preferred for reasons that we will see short, shortly. So almost all multipliers implement multiplication with right shift. 
even though multiplication would rate left shift is also possible. So why do we pre-multiply the multiplicand by 2 to the k? In other words, why does this recurrence contains a times 2 to the k rather than just a? a times 2 to the k is basically these red dots that you see. So I take a, shift it up by k bits, so a appears here. Okay, then, so I add that to P0. Let's say P0 is equal to 0. And let's say XJ is equal to 1. X0 is equal to 1. This is 1. So 1 times A is this A. I add that to the partial product and then shift it to the right. When I shift it to the right, the dots move into this position. Okay, then the next time I add something here, the previous one is shifted to the right by one bit. The next time I add something here, it's shifted by two bits and so on. So here is an example of that basic multiplication algorithm, both with right shift and left shifts in tabular form. So this is the way in which I sh represent uh, the algorithms so that we can trace the various steps and see what was done with each operand and what are the intermediate results. And this is the way in which you will present uh, the results of homework. So if homework involved doing a multiplication using a particular algorithm, this tabular representation is what you're expected to uh, to offer, to present. Okay, so here is A, 1, 0, 1, 0. So focus on the right shift algorithm first. Here is A, 1, 0, 1, 0. That's 10. Here is X, 1, 0, 1, 1. That's 11. And the result at the bottom should be 10 times 11, which is 110. Okay. So the first thing we do, we shift A to the left by 4 bits, by K bits in general. So that's the place where addition takes place. A times to the K, either multiplied by 0 which is 0, or multiplied by 1, which is a times to the k. So this value, either this value or 0, will be added in these positions. So p0 is initialized to 0, plus x0 times a, x0 times a. I add these two, I get 0, 1, 0, 1. And then I have to do right shift to get P1. That's why I call this intermediate result 2P1, because when right shifted, it will give me P1. So I've extended it by one bit, so that when I shift, this 0 will go into this high order position. Notice that this value has now been shifted to the right by one bit. The next bit of x x1 is also 1, so x1 times a leads to the addition of 1, 0, 1, 0 from up there. Again, 1, 1, 1, 1, extended by 0, so that when right shifted, it gives me p2. And notice that p2 has been shifted to the right by 2 bits at this point. The next bit of x is 0. So I add 0, no change in there. Again, extended by 1 bit, right shift. And finally, x3 times a is 1 times a. And then add, that's 1. 1 plus 1 is 0, carry 1. That 1 goes there, 1. And then right shift and you get the result. 
So here's the check. 10 times 11 should be 110. And 110 is 64 plus 32 plus 8 plus 4. So here it is, 64 plus 32 plus 8 plus 4 plus 2. So this indeed is 110. And I got the correct result using this multiplication recurrence. In each step, I multiply a digit of x by a. And that product will be either a, a copy of a, of course, shifted to the left by 4 bits because I'm really multiplying it by a times 2 to the k. Or 0. If the digit of x is 0, the result will be 0. OK, so let's now do the multi multiplication using the left shift algorithm highlighted here. This is the recurrence from the previous slide. So a and x are written at the top. p0 is initialized to 0. So the algorithm says double the partial product and add xk minus j minus 1 times a. So double the partial product. Here is the doubled partial product. OK, and then we start from the high end this time. 1 times a is a. Add these two. Left shift. Then the next uh, bit to be considered is 0. This one's 0. So there's 0, add, left shift. So when I get P2, I left shift it to get 2P2 before I do the next addition. Then x1 times a, 1 times a, then x0 times a, and I get the exact same result. Okay, so it seems that the two methods are comparable. I do the same number of operations, and each iteration involves either a right shift or left shift, which are equally easy. And the same number of iterations. However, when I add here, you know, the partial product basically grows in width. And when I add this number to that partial product, OK, I have to be prepared for a carry to be generated in this position, as it happens here. And that will affect the high order bits. Therefore, carry can propagate. Therefore, the adder that I use here is not really a 4-bit adder that just adds this to this. But it has to be an 8-bit adder in case a carry is generated in the position 3 and affects positions 4 and higher. OK, whereas in the right shift algorithm, my adder is 4 bits wide because addition takes place in this part. Now, the bits that move to the right are never added to anything. OK, they just move further to the right as we proceed. Nothing is ever added to them. So their value will not change once they move into this lower half. The addition always takes place in this upper half. And the width of the adder is always 4 bits. OK, so this needs a 4-bit adder, whereas this uh, multiplication with left shift needs an 8-bit adder. That's why we prefer multiplication with right shifts, because an 8-bit adder is both more expensive and also slower. So why bother with that when this, this uh, multiplication with right shift works? OK, now in the old days of digital computation, we 
did not have hardware multipliers in our processors. So if there was a multiply instruction, and sometimes there wasn't, if there was, that multiply instruction was actually programmed. In other words, it uh, generated uh, an exception and a special multiply routine would be run to perform the multiplication. Or we didn't have a multiply instruction at all and we had to program multiplication. So even though we don't need to do this uh, nowadays, it's instructive to look through how you would go about doing multiplication in software using machine instructions. And this program, I leave it up to you to study, basically has a loop corresponding to the multiply iterations, M loop, multiply loop. does the shifting and then either if no addition needs to take place if the next digit of the multiplier is zero we branch to no add when no addition takes place otherwise we, we fall through to this addition where the addition takes place and then basically these rotates take care of the shifting For, uh, in preparation for the next step. So basically, if we have a 32-bit multiplication, this loop, which has quite a few instructions in it, will be executed 32 times. So we are talking about hundreds of instructions being executed for performing one multiply. So it's, it's pretty slow. But if you read this program and understand how it works, basically helps you understand the multiplication algorithm. That's why I, I've included it in this chapter, even though we don't really use such a program anymore. So here is a basic hardware multiplier. There are a bunch of registers. The multiplier X is stored in this register. The multiplicand A is stored in this register. And the double width partial product will be formed in this double width register. Now the upper half of that register is added to one of two things, either A or zero. Why the upper half? Recall from that tabular representation that addition takes place in the upper half of this double width. So the lower half basically is just a place for bits to move into and no arithmetic operation takes place there. So the upper half of the partial product, double width partial product, is added either to A or to 0. And which one of those two is selected depends on the next bit of X. So initially X0 dictates whether to add 0 or A. Then when we shift the double width partial product to the right, as the algorithm requires, right shift, we shift the multiplier also to the right to expose its next bit. Because after we have processed bit 0, we, we, we need to look at bit 1. So bit 1 will be brought to this position so that we can see it and use it to do the next selection. So this operation takes place. Uh, addition takes place. The result is placed into the register, right shift, of the double width partial product occurs, right shift of the multiplier occurs, so that the next bit is exposed, and then that next bit is used for the next cycle. After k cycles, basically all of the bits of x have been processed, all k additions have been ta have taken place, and this will be the double width partial product. 
So the hardware required for a multiplier basically is an adder and a few registers, not, nothing much. And this multiplexer to select A or 0 to be added in the next step. Okay, of course, there's a control unit sitting here that controls the iterations. It has a counter uh, to the counts maybe from 32 down to 0 to control how many times these iterations take place. Okay, now we can observe here that so this is, a, let, let's first go through an example, numerical example. Uh, the multiplier is 11. The multiplicand is 10. So I put, so this is an animated example where you see exactly how 11, x equal to 11 is multiplied by a equal to 10. So the first bit of uh, x is 1. So this partial product is initialized to 0. The first addition that takes place, because the rightmost digit of x is 1, a copy of 1010 will be added to the partial product, and we get 1010. Then we shift the multiplier to the right. We shift the partial product to the right. And again, we see that the next bit is 1. So 1010 one, one, must be added to the blue number. And this is the sum. Again, right shift the multiplier. Right shift the partial product. The next digit is 0, so 0 will be added, so nothing changes. And then we right shift both the multiplier and the partial product. And finally, 1 times 1010 one, one, will be added. And then we right shift the multiplier, it disappears and right shift the partial product. Now let me go back and retrace these steps to show you something interesting. So here is the beginning. Notice that the double width partial product register is unused in its lower half. Okay. Then after the first shift, Three bits of that double width register are unused. And we have three bits left of the multiplier. And after the next shifts, that shifted, this shifted, two bits of that double width register are unused. And we need two bits to store the multiplier. And then one bit. And by the, by the time we get rid of the entire multiplier, the double width partial product occupies the entire double width register. So these two registers can actually be shared because they never interfere with each other. Okay, so I don't need a separate register for the multiplier. Okay, initially, so let me go back to the previous slide. I can put the multiplier x in the lower half of that double width register and then just shift that double width register to the right and bits of x basically get out of the way as bits of p move in to occupy that space. So I just need two registers, a multiplicand register and a double width register initialized to 0 in its upper half and to x in its lower half. And basically this is what was done 
in this uh, algorithm. Okay, so the double width register contains both uh, the partial product and uh, the multiplier. Okay. So now, in this uh, example, the way I drew it, uh, I said that the output of the adder is put into the double width register, and that the double width register is shifted to the right. Okay, that shift to the right always occurs. Okay, it's not conditional. Always after I put the data in the register, I have to shift to the right. So I might as well put the data into the register and shift it form to avoid a two-step process. Okay, so the output of the adder comes and is placed in the register not in the same k bit positions but one bit to the right. The carry out of the adder is placed here. And then these k minus one bits are placed here. And this bit is used to control the operation in the current cycle. Okay, in each cycle, this bit is used to control the operation. That's the next bit of the multiplier. And then once shift to the right occurs because I put the values here in shifted form, so there isn't a separate shift process. I put the data in there already in shifted form. Then this bit disappears and its place will be taken by the next bit. Notice that the multiplier and the partial product coexist in this register. At any given time, the subset of the bits are taken by the multiplier. The rest of the bits are taken by the partial product, and the two never interfere. This boundary is never violated. Because at this, as this one moves to occupy an extra bit, this one moves to the right and needs one fewer bit. So this is multiplication with left shift. As you see, the adder at the bottom is 2k bits wide. OK, what about multiplying signed numbers? So far, we focused on unsigned multiplication. Uh, what about multiplying two's complement numbers? So here I've shown an example of two's complement numbers. A is a negative number because it starts with 1. X is a positive number because it starts with 0. Well, it turns out that the exact same algorithm would work here because basically what we said in the previous algorithm was we have to multiply 1 by a, then 2 by a, then 4 by a. Well, if a happens to be negative, the same process works. 1 times that negative value plus 2 times that negative value plus 4 times that negative value gives me a negative result, which is the correct product of these two numbers. OK, so here it is. 1 times this number is this number. Do the addition. The only change here is that this is now a negative value. And instead of extending it with 0 before shifting to the right, I have to sign extend. So this is a negative value. I copy the sign here so that after right shift, it remains a negative value. OK, so if I honor this uh, requirement, I get the correct result. Again, add a in the next step. Add a in the next step. Shift to the right after sign extension. Add 0. Shift to the right after sign extension. Add A, 
shift to the right after sign extension and finally add zero the final bit of x and I get and then right shift again sign extend and right shift I get this negative number which is the product of this negative number and this positive number so let's check to see what we got the negative number is negative 10 the positive number is 11 and the result should be negative 110 and this is actually negative 110 because it's a two's complement number so this is negative 512 negative 512 plus 256 plus 128 plus 16 plus 2 which reduces to negative 110. Okay, so when the multiplier is positive, we don't need any change in the algorithm except to watch for the sign extensions in the intermediate steps. In other words, you don't have to write it there. Just be mindful that when you right shift something that is negative, insert the sign bit in this vacated position. So this one, keep losing my pointer. This one moves here and the place vacated by that sign bit is filled with a sign bit. Okay, now what if the uh, multiplicand is negative or both numbers are negative? What do we do then? So here's an example where both numbers are negative. So this two's complement number, remember, x, remember the interpretation of two's complement number, this is really one plus 4 minus 16. In other words, all bits are considered with positive weight except the sign bit, which is considered with negative weight. So this is 1 plus 4, which is 5, minus 16. So this is negative 11. And this one is 2 plus 4, which is 6, minus 16. So I'm multiplying negative 10 by negative 11, and the result should be positive 110, which is correct. So basically, I say the product is 1 times this number plus 4 times this number minus 16 times this number. Okay, so I carry out the exact same algorithm except I switch to subtraction in the last cycle instead of doing addition. So I do addition for all the bits as usual, but I do subtraction for the sign bit position. Very convenient. Basically, I don't need to modify much except remember to do a subtraction instead of addition in the very last cycle. And the steps are traced here Okay, you can follow those on your own and see what is going on. So here's the first add, right shift. Again, I have sign extension, right shift, right shift, right shift. This is the fourth bit, which is zero. And then instead of plus x4 times a, I do minus x4 or add the complement of a. And this is the two's complement of A. I add that, and I get this positive number as the product. Okay, so two's complement multiplication is no big deal. We just do the same uh, algorithm, except in the very last cycle, we do subtraction. By the way, this would have worked on the previous example. Do additions for all the bits, except for the last one. This being zero, addition and subtraction are really the same. So 
it would have worked. So in choose complement multiplication, basically whether the numbers are positive or negative, doesn't matter. We do additions in all but the last cycle. We do subtraction in the last cycle and we get the correct result. Okay, so this is a choose complement hardware multiplier. Very similar to the previous one. Again, these two registers can share space. I've drawn them separately for clarity, but the multiplier can be stored in the lower half of this register as before. So here I have an adder subtractor. It can do subtraction if I input the complement of the multiplicand and then insert a carry in of one. So this signal supplied by the control unit is zero in all cycles. When this is zero, basically the uncomplemented multiplicand is selected. When it's one, the complemented multiplicand is selected. When this signal is one, which happens only in the very last cycle, this carry in is also one. So one's complementation with the addition of one forms a two's complement. Okay, so again, this is a very simple hardware, just an adder plus a multiplexer and the control unit which keeps track of the number of iterations, say 32 for 32-bit multiplication. And it also keeps track, uh, remembers to assert the signal, this control signal, in the very last cycle so that subtraction is performed instead of addition. So the multiplier bit is used to enable the multiplexer. If the multiplexer is not enabled, then it always outputs zero. So if this bit is zero, the multiplexer is not enabled, so zero will be forwarded to the add. If this bit is one, then the multiplexer is enabled, depending on the select signal, either A or A bar is forwarded, with A bar going through only in the last cycle. Okay, so that's basically a two's complement multiplier. <clears throat> There's a transformation of numbers, binary numbers, into numbers with digits 0, 1, and minus 1 that is known as boots recoding. Boots recoding is basically a parallel recoding according to this table. So it says whenever you see xi, and then to the right of it is something, some digit, then replace it with this yi. So if you see 0 with a 0 to its right, replace it with 0. In other words, don't change it. If you see a 0 with a 1 to its right, replace it with a 1. So this 0 is replaced with a 1. If you see a 1 with a 0 to its right, replace it with minus 1. And if you see 1 followed by 1, replace it with 0. Okay, originally this boot recoding was motivated by, in early multi multipliers, addition was a pretty time-consuming process. So when you had something like this, when you had three additions in a row, add, 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 so here, do not add, 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 add. It's a little bit faster if you replace these three adds in a row by a subtract, nothing, nothing, and add. So in other words, this is 7. You can look at this as 7. 7 is 8 minus 1. Okay. So by replacing a string of 1s, with a negative one in its least significant position, with zeros everywhere else, and a one after the end of the string of ones, you reduce the number of add, subtract, and therefore speed up 
multiplication in those very early computers. Notice that in the multiplier that we have here, basically the critical path of each cycle still goes through the adder even if you are adding zero. So if this number is zero, we still pay the adder latency. This is because it's a synchronous, it's a synchronous operation. Each cycle takes the same amount of time. Therefore, we don't worry the, about the fact that we are adding zero. We are wasting time, basically, because all the cycles have to be the same length. Okay, but in early computers, uh, you know, avoiding that addition uh, saved time. So, boot recoding basically achieves this. So basically, once I've recoded the number from its original form to boots recoded form, I can multiply this number, which is equivalent to the original number, by doing this. Do nothing, subtract, do nothing, do nothing, add, subtract, add, subtract, and so on. So for every zero, I do nothing. For every one, I add. For every negative one, I subtract. Notice that in this example, actually, boot recoding has done things, has made things worse. Because here I had a one, so there was an add. That one has been replaced by an add and a subtract. This one has been replaced by that. So don't worry about that. So we, we don't use boot recoding in this form anymore. So we'll see how we use it later on. So this is the example of boot recoding. So x, the multiplier, has been recoded as y, the boot recoded form. And then we follow that process. Subtract, add, subtract, add, subtract, and we get the correct result. Okay. Now, there are situations where we multiply numbers by constants. Of course, when we multiply numbers by constants, uh, we can fetch that constant from a register or from memory and just input it to the multiplier. So an ordinary multiplier can be used for multiplying, let's say, to constant 12 by x just as it can be used for multiplying x by y or a by x. However, there are often faster ways of multiplying constants that take less time or less hardware than using a multiplier. So for example, if my, in my program, uh, if I'm writing a high-level language program in which y is assigned the value 12x plus 1. Of course, a compiler can go and say, OK, this is a multiplication. Issue a multiply instruction. One operand is x, uh, some location in, in some register. And one operand is 12 that I previously put in a register or memory location. So basically, this is a multiply instruction. On the other hand, an intelligent compiler can say 12 times x is basically 3 times x times 4. And 3 times x is 2 times x plus x. And 2 times x is shifted x. So I can use a shift to compute 2x. I can do an add to compute 3x. And then I can do a 2-bit shift to compute 12x. OK, so a few shifts and an add, which are often faster than doing a regular multiplication, can be applied here. So a smart compiler basically compares that alternative of using shifts and adds to using a multiply instruction and will compile accordingly, whichever is faster. OK. Multiplications by constants occur very often. They are hidden. Here, there's a, obviously an explicit multiplication by constant. 
But when you have array elements, to access array elements, let's say AIJ, the address of AIJ is the base of the array plus n times i plus j, where n is the one of the dimensions of the array. I'm assuming storage in row major order. Therefore, this is a hidden multiplication. When I, and whenever I access AIJ, actually this multiplication occurs at the machine level, at the code level. There's no multiplication in the high-level language program, but there is an actual multiplication there. But this multiplication is by constant. And if that constant is uh, basically uh, a good constant, so for example, if this array dimension is, let's say, 256, the multiplication by 256 is just a shift. I don't need to do an actual multiplication. Okay, so a lot of times in uh, running programs, we have multiplications by constant. And also when you built a custom VLSI, where some expression has to be evaluated in hardware or in, on an FPGA, whenever you have multiplication by constant, you can generate hardware that is simpler uses fewer gates or uses fewer of the FPGA blocks and uses less energy if you implement it using shift and adds. Okay, so we are motivated to look into these shift and add methods. So the most obvious uh, method for multiplying by constants such as 113 is to just use the binary expansion of 113 to guide us through the process determining you know, which additions and which shifts are required. So this is the process shown. These R's are registers and the number used uh, for the R in front of R basically shows what multiple of the number is stored there. So this is twice the number, then three times the number, then six times, then seven times, then 112 times. So these do not need to be distinct registers, but I've written it in this way to make it easier to understand. So twice, so the value in R1 needs to be multiplied by 113. So shift left R1, store in R2. So that's twice R1. Add R2 to R1. That's three times R1. Then double that by shifting left six times. Add R1 seven times. Shift left by four, multiply by 16. You'll shift left by four because there is a four bit gap here between this one and this one. Oh, I'm sorry. We are going from the from the left left to right. So basically, these operations are obtained by noting that every time you have a one, so this one is basically initialization where you have R1. The next one requires a shift and add. So here, the first two operations are shift and add. Then another shift and add for this one. Then shift, whenever you have zero, you just have shift. Okay, so shift, 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 shift and add. Those are the four shifts followed by add. Okay, now as I said, these registers need not be distinct. In fact, other than R1, we need just one other register, which at this point contains twice R1. And then that, that register that contains twice, twice R1 are added to R1. And the results stored in the same register OK, so this is the same register because I no longer need twice R, R1. 
then that register is doubled. So this is still the same register. So we're, I'm really using two registers, R1, which holds the operand, and another register to hold the intermediate result. OK, now you notice that there are three ones in a row there. So this reminds us of boot recoding. What if I apply boot recoding here? Oh, first of all, uh, if I have an instruction that does both shift and add, so in other words, shift add instruction, I can shift one of the operands of the addition by a desired amount, then these two become one instruction. So R1 shift left added to R1 gives me R3. R3 shift left added to R1 gives me R7. R7 shift left by four bits added. So I need just three instructions, three shift add instructions to implement this multiplication by 113. OK, so here is the booth recoded representation of 113. Those three ones in a row sort of gave us the idea to reduce the number of operations. So I replaced 111 by 100 negative 1. So I applied the same thing. This one is just initialization. Then shift, sorry, shift, shift, subtract. So that's why you see shift left three and then subtract. And then shift, 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 add. So fresh four shift followed by add. And again, if I have shift uh, and add, subtract instruction, I need just two instructions. So I can add, I can multiply a number by 113 using two shift add or subtract instruction, which is pretty good. You know, 113 looks, uh, doesn't look at such, such a simple number. So it's probably much faster to use these two shift adds than to do multiplication. And if I'm doing hardware implementation, I'm using uh, shift is basically, you know, connecting wires because the shift is a constant here. I just need two adders to do this multiplication. Okay, so less hardware is used. Okay, sometimes factorization helps. So if I'm interested in multiplying by 119, I could use the previous method, but I could also observe that 119 is 7 times 17. It turns out 7 is a power of 2 minus 1, and 17 is a power of 2 plus 1. So basically, 2 shift and add suffice. So I multiply by 7 by multiplying by 8 and then subtracting 1 and then multiply by 17 by multiplying by 16 and then adding one time. And then this becomes two instructions. So factorization sometimes helps. So here is basically a hardware implementation of multiplication by 119. One nineteen is one twenty eight minus eight minus one. So I use a carry save adder to add the three numbers one hundred and twenty eight times x. X left shifted by eight bits, then uh, minus eight x. That's basically left shifted x by 3 bits complemented. And that one carry in of 1 inserted into the carry save adder forms the 2's complement. And then this is the 2's complement of x is the 1's complement of x. 
with this one basically providing that, uh, that additional one. So here the hardware needed to multiply by 119 is a carry save adder and a regular carry propagate adder. Okay, much simpler than a full-blown multiplier. Now both compilers and uh, VLSI hardware design aids are aware of these transformations. They have built-in tables. Whenever they encounter, for example, the number 119, they refer to that table to see if there is a simple hardware implementation, or in the case of compilers, a simple sequence of instructions that does that for us. And then they use that simpler hardware or simpler sequence of instructions. Uh, people have also studied multiplication by multiple constants. So if you have an application in which a value x needs to be multiplied, this is just a toy example, by 45, 49, and 65. Okay, so these are three constants. You can use the methods that we just discussed three times. But also, there are algorithms that take the three constants and say if we can do some sharing between them. So uh, what I've shown on the slide uh, so far is that 45 is 9 times 5. So I form 9 times R1 and then multiply that by 5. 49 is 7 times R1. And then that thing multiplied by 7 again, which is a left shift and subtract. And then finally, 65 is 64 plus 1. So I need five instructions to do all three multiplications by constant. But if I'm clever, I can use three instructions. By forming 65 first using one instruction and then noting that 49 is 65 minus 16 and then 49 sorry 45 is 49 minus 4 okay so I can share the hardware or I can use fewer instructions if this were a compiler trying to compute these. I multiply all three numbers by x uh, in less time or in less hardware. So this is known as multiplication by multiple constants in the literature. Okay, the final item is a preview of fast multipliers. And now we said that a multiplication is basically a two-step process, forming all the partial products and then adding them together. Okay, so there are two ways that occur to us immediately to speed things up. If those, there are fewer of those partial products, then we can add them faster. So instead of, let's say, in 32-bit multiplication, if instead of 32 partial products, if somehow we can reduce them to 16 without too much complexity, then we can add them faster. Okay? And also use less hardware. So reduce the number of operands to be added. So multiplication is basically a multi-operand addition. We can speed it up by reducing the number of operands to be added, and then by adding those operands faster. And the second technique leads to uh, parallel pipeline multi-operand additions that we'll see mostly in Chapter 11. Uh, reducing the number of operands we see in Chapter 10 which is high radix multiplication. So basically, if I do multiplication in radix 4 instead of radix 2, then there are half as many radix 4 digits 
as there are radix two digits. Of course, multiplying radix four digits are, is a little bit harder than multiplying radix two digits, but we'll see techniques for basically doing those uh, rather quickly so that we gain speed by reducing the number of things to be added by a factor of two, if we do things in radix four, by a factor of three, if we do things in radix eight, and so on. And then once we have covered high radix division, uh, high, high radix multiplication, sorry, in chapter 10, and tree and array multipliers in chapter 11, uh, a bunch of miscellaneous topics, other methods of building multipliers, will be covered in chapter, the last chapter of this part, chapter 12. Okay, so this is basically it for uh, the start of our discussion on multiplication. I'll see you in the next lecture to discuss high radix multipliers. Uh, bye for now.